Okay, hey everybody, this is Juanita Waterman, and I am here with Deanne Hall. Say hi to everybody, Deanne. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hope your day is going well. Yeah. Well, I just um, met Deanne on Facebook. She was one of my friends and has been one of my friends for a little while. And one of my goals on Facebook is not to just have him as a friend, but actually get to know him a little bit. So this morning when I was online, I saw that Deanne was too, and I decided to say hi and um, ask her about her blog because she did have one. And when I read her blog, I found out some things about her that I thought were very helpful and would help other people. So I asked her if I could do an interview and she said yes, very fortunately. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and just do this quick interview and uh, see if you can get something out of it for yourself. So Deanne, where are you from? I was raised in Southern California in a place called Santa Clarita. Um, had a pretty interesting um, and yet challenging childhood. That's a long story. I have, I have many long stories. Um, I uh, was raised there until I was 15. I moved to the Midwest for a couple of years. Uh, ended up in upstate New York for a while and then spent most of my time in Montana. And now I'm in Phoenix. Okay. Now you say you're, you know, you had a challenging time as, <laughs> in your childhood years. Um, now I also know you had lost 100 pounds. Did some of the yeah, a little over 100 pounds. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't <laughs> like a scale. I don't like scales. So, <laughs> That's yeah. okay. So was something in your childhood affected that weight gain that, that I triggered it, you think? Yes. Mm -hmm. When um, I, I had a lot of, uh, like I said, challenges in my childhood, which, of course, when you, ha when you have challenges with uh, parental figures, you end up doing something that makes you feel good, and eating made me feel good. Um, it made it was an integral part of our family. My my parents were from the Midwest, and basically, you know, food was a way to make me feel better. Uh huh. So, and I was a from about the time of six, uh, became a chubby child. And in the sixties, uh, you know, you were one of forty five kids in your class that were and I, I had a weight problem on and off all of my life. Um, I would, you know, go on these terrible stringent diets and lose weight and then turn around and gain it back. And it, it had something to do with an emotional problem, you know, as far as mine went. Now, um, did, did, did it protect you? Do you feel like you used it as a protection? I hear a lot of people oh, say that. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and I used it as a protection mode. Uh, in way into my adulthood, so uh, it kept me. It kept me from having to um, have relationships that I was scared of. Right. You know what I mean mm -hmm. with people. Right. And, and people, um, it kept me at a distance. Yes, it was. A, it was a protection well, were mechanism. You, were, were you? So you could you say? Would I be wrong to say that you were afraid of people? Um. Yeah, I have I had lots of other issues besides my weight, and they all came together at one point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I always had anxiety issues. Um, um, those anxiety issues were always something that, again, my weight protected me from. You know, I didn't have to um, I didn't have to correspond with people um, because I was heavy, you know, and it, it kept me at a, di at a distance. So emotionally, I didn't have to deal with the anxiety, which I've had since I was young as well, um, and overcame that as well. Wow. Um, so it, that it, it's something, and, you know, I do believe that anxiety is, uh, can be a pre-existing condition just with the synapses in your brain and your DNA. Okay, mm -hmm. but I also believe you can overcome those um, with, um, there's many, many different ways. I've, I've done it throughout my life, but um, cognitive development programs, things like that. Um, but, yes, yeah, so it had to do with mainly, it was a deeper rooted situation. Of, you know, my weight was just a secondary thing. Right. It had to do with my self-esteem and what went on in my childhood to make me feel that way. Right, and, and, and when you... Um... <laughs> you know, feared people, it wasn't so much, was it, was it more, you had more fear of what they would say 
about you or I, to you? I think I had or... a fear of what they thought about me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what they thought about me. Mm-hmm. My, my, and, and you know, I, I know this sounds selfish, and it is a selfish situation. Uh-huh. When your anxiety is a selfish situation that you actually create in your own mind, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. And you don't look at it as a selfish situation, but it really is because it prevents you from giving your entire mm-hmm. being to anybody, and it protects you from being in relationships and and having to deal with um, who you really are. It, it stems from the fact that you don't want to reveal yourself to the world. Yeah, why don't you share your motto with people about that? You have an excellent motto that helps you overcome that. Well, it's not about me. That's my mantra. Mm-hmm. It's not about me. Oh, yeah, mantra, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's my mantra. Uh, you, right. you know, I, it's not about you. And, and with that mantra, it keeps you from... Uh, using anxiety as a as a crutch or as a what would you call it as a um... well anxiety is a very complicated and people who do have anxiety and there are many many out there that mm-hmm. that that wear a facade and they wear a mask and every day they are literally in hell oh. okay yeah and they uh, they do not. They, it is, it, yes, it's a protection me- mechanism, and they don't really realize that, but um, they do. They wear a facade. They pretend they don't have it. They, there are many people that suffer with um, anxiety disorder from um, just social anxiety to actual um, paranoia and um, just anxiety to the point of panic attacks. I've had those. Um, I've had, I mean, literally 20, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, I could not have talked to them at this point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, you're I would have had a fan, I would have had a panic attack and said, <laughs> no way, <laughs> I can't talk to this person. Right. And people who have panic attacks do not realize, um, sometimes they don't even realize what they are. Right. They just know that their body symptoms are overtaking their mind. Mm. And they have no idea what's going on with themselves. They end up in emergency rooms. Wow. They end up in, in in hospitals. And the doctors are going, there's nothing physically wrong with you. But they are feeling their body symptoms are so extraordinarily terrible feeling. And, and literally, they, they have no idea what's going on with them. And they live in a world that is a box. That they is... live in a box. They they have agoraphobia. They cannot walk out of the house. They cannot be around people. Um, they they constantly second guess themselves and everything that they do. And panic attacks can come on for absolutely no reason because once you create the synapses in your brain that lead to those panic attacks, um, they will just keep coming over and over and over, and you have no idea what's going on with yourself. Wow. At all. So you can't even you if if you don't know what's going on, it's really hard to treat. Um, so I have the, my question is now you went through all that personally, what led you to, um, your mantra? Um, you know, it's not about me. What, what was your first step in your journey? What was your first, what what do you call those, uh, points in life where you have a realization? I forget what they're called. (laughs) Uh-huh. An aha moment. Oh, sure, aha moment. That's moments. what I call them. I call them an aha mm-hmm. moment or an o- OMG moment. You uh-huh. know what I mean? Um, uh-huh. I, I when I realized that I was absolutely um, my life was being was on hold. Let's put it that way. Uh-huh. Uh, I could not literally do or function. When, um, what made you realize dated, that? What made you realize that? Was there a situation? Was there, like, you couldn't save your cat's life or, you know, something traumatic that happened sort of like that? That just When I a... realized one day that I could not drive on a highway in a car uh-huh. without having a panic attack, I realized that I was going to go nowhere in my life. If this was, if this was what was making me suffer, um, I needed to find a way out. And I knew I was not going to go anywhere with my life or help anybody or do anything. And, 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 this, and this goes into every area of how everybody's many years life. Of, how many years ago was that, um, Deanne? That was in my 20s. 
That was in your 20s. So you started this journey mm-hmm. in your 20s. Oh, yeah, way back in my 20s. Okay. So probably you... my early 20s. So that and, was... Um, Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, and so that's when no. you finally realized you can't live like this anymore. Right. And um, I got to the point where it, it got so bad that my day-to-day living was... I felt like I was living in hell. You know, it was like, if this is hell, I just want to die. And people who have panic disorder and panic attacks, they literally feel like, you know what, it's, it, it would be easier to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, so, really I, so, did you um, go from there to finally realizing something? What was the first lifeline that you found to pull you out of that kind of thinking or out of that, that there was hope? What was a lifeline to you? It was a cognitive development program that I started listening to. How did you that find helped it? Me. <clears throat> I actually was uh, watching an infomercial mm-hmm. on TV mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, late, late at night thinking, oh, my God, I can't live like this. Mm-hmm. I cannot live like this. And I got that, and, and it, that started my journey, and it, you know, it, it helped me a bit. What I'm not are, what, say okay, so what, what's a cognitive um, whatever that – what, did, what is cognitive? It's a, it's a development program where you listen, you learn to retrain your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Our, mm-hmm. our thoughts, you know, what we think about, which is a whole other, mm-hmm. a whole other interview probably. Right. But what you, what you think about, um, you become, what you think about most of the time you become. And I don't know if a lot of people, some people will understand this and some people won't, but you are exactly where you're supposed to be because you created that. Right. So you, from the time from the time you started thinking, from the time that you were put on this this planet, you created your reality. So it sounds like you took responsibility by listening to those tapes. It sounds like they said, "Okay, take some responsibility here, Deanne." Well, you have to learn that you are responsible. And when you stop blaming all the outside situations that have come into your life for where you are, you realize, oh, oh my God, I created just exactly where I am today. Mm-hmm. And I don't care if you're 20 years old or you're 50 years old, you are still where you're exactly supposed to be because you created it. Mm-hmm. Now, there, there's this saying that everybody's heard of, um, if you... Do the, if you do the same thing every day and expect something different, mm-hmm. or you think the same thing every day <laughs> and you expect something different, exactly. that's insanity. So okay? What do, okay, so what do you and, say, and, I, I just want to know this, what do you say to people that say, you know, I've tried that, you know, have you ever talked to those people, I tried that, I tried thinking mm-hmm. positive and it didn't work. What do you say to those people? How can we help those people? Because I, this is the, those are the people I run into. I know it works. You know it works. But maybe together we can help the people that are like, it didn't work for me. I tried it and it didn't work. How can we help them overcome that hump? Well, one thing that you always have to remember is you're never there. Ooh. And what I, what I mean by that is you are never done Mm -hmm. okay with personal development or personal growth and if somebody says to you i found it i'm done Mm. they're lying they're lying to themselves and they're lying to everyone else Mm. so i really have problems with gurus that sell tons of books and let's go we can just name a few you know the the secret the the law of attraction all that stuff and they all say that they have it, mm-hmm. okay? They're there. They've done it, so forth. Well, you know, we all are on a, a path, a continual path. It's a, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes we step off the path mm-hmm. because we need to learn a lesson, and then we get back <laughs> on the path. But we're, but we're never there. And we are always need to remember that we are the next day that we have as a blessing on this earth is something to learn. If you don't learn something new every day and open your eyes, and I'm talking open your spiritual eyes, not just your physical eyes, but open your eyes and ask the universe, ask the source, show me, what am I supposed to learn today? 
how am I supposed to, to, to better myself for other people? You know what I mean? Something that I can give to, to, to someone else to help them. And even if it's just a smile that made them have um, the, you know, a good feeling inside, then that may have been the only thing that you were put there for that day. But we're never done. We're always on a path till our physical bodies die. And then we will continue on that path spiritually. I love that. I love that because, you know, I think about the time when I used to think like that. You know, I used to think, oh, I've tried all that. It doesn't work. And then all of a sudden I realized why it didn't work for me. And now what you just added to it just gives it another. I've just learned something even better. It's not just that, and not that I didn't always know it, but the way you put it to, as a learning lesson for this in this context, that you're never done learning, you're never done growing. So how you're never done could, right. yeah, you're never how, done running, always run. So how can you're you always yeah? So how can you quit doing it? How can you quit being on the path when you're never done being on that path? That I I love that. I absolutely you can't. love that. That is just so you, fabulous. You, you mm-hmm. can't. And um, I just feel like all of our, everybody goes through what they, again, created. Mm -hmm. And what I say, and a lot of people might have some problems with this, and I respect everybody's belief. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have, uh, I I don't push my belief um, on anybody else. Mm -hmm. I believe you will come to terms with what you feel, again, a and, and this goes. This is going to go off the off the the point here that that we were talking about. But if we could stop living by our living by our and, what? And I'm our, sorry, living our by our brain, what? our uh, brain, by our brain. Okay, mm-hmm. our, if we can remember that our brain is our logical force that in our in our body that gives us warnings. Okay, mm-hmm. and it's only there to to warn us about danger and things like that. But if we can learn to live and feel from our heart. That is what every great teacher, including Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. was trying to tell us to stop living. You need to change the way you think. So as a man thinketh, so he is. That's a quote from the Bible. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So so that's awesome. So tell me this thing. So you went from the, the to, you started listening to those tapes. How long did it take you before you, were, you graduated to another phase, another step? Um, <clears throat> what was your next I'm going, step? I'm, I'm going to say it was a process at sometimes second by second, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. literally. Mm-hmm. Um, and each day, um, it became second by second. I mean, because I was so bad. Wow. You would not believe how bad I was. I was so bad. I was so paranoid. I was so scared of everything. Wow. From... From dying to, I, there was a point where I was scared of choking, wow. eating food. I mean, it got really bad, Juanita, to yeah. the point where I wouldn't leave the house. I was scared to just live. Mm-hmm. I was scared to wake up the next day. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so, again, it went from second to second to minute to minute, minute it became days, and then. So if somebody's listening to this right now and they feel they feel like that they're having those same kind of symptoms, what would you advise them to do? To live in the moment. Okay, that is the first thing I was taught, was to live in the moment. Okay, the past is gone and you cannot change it. Mm-hmm. The future is a second away. Mm-hmm. If you cannot learn to live in the moment and you are going to always be afraid of the, and I call them the what ifs, Mm-hmm. Because we live, um, people with anxiety and panic disorder and all those things live in a what if um, day to day mode. Okay, mm-hmm. and you have to learn to change your thought patterns. You have synopsis that you have created over time that tell your body these are the symptoms that are going to happen. If you think this way, and it is only your brain, you're not going to die from a panic attack. Nobody's ever died from a panic attack. Nobody's ever died from an anxious episode. Yes, they feel like they're going to die, but they've never died. Okay? You have to learn how to think. Rethink. 
rethink, retrain, reprogram. So is there a uh, program that you would suggest to them that they could use now that maybe was better than the one you found when you were 20 that you think is really a great program for people right now that need that book or need that video or need that, um, li you know, that life jacket kind of, so to speak? There are many, many programs out there now that have um, kind of spawned off of that one um, that I listened to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the things in that program that I wouldn't recommend, mm -hmm. I would recommend maybe going out and um, <laughs> the funny thing is if you, if you bring this up to just your friends, mm -hmm. your relatives, or somebody that you love, you'll probably find that they have experienced the same thing. And they might have a they just They just never told you because it's something that's really embarrassing. If you cannot control yourself and you feel like you're going to die, who, I mean, you're not going to tell anybody that. That's a fear that you live. That's one thing with anxiety. It's a fear that you live alone with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know, really you, can't you, tell everybody. I mean, you're, you'd be the downer Debbie if you did that. Well, yeah, and they would think you're nuts mm -hmm. because some people have never experienced anxiety, but many, 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 many people have, and they haven't realized it. There are many self-help books out there. Um, I can't, and like I said, I did one program, and then I, that took me into a journey of me learning by myself, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I, that I want to stress to anybody who's listening to this, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> never take Never take anything that anybody says 100%. Always question it. Always put it um, in your heart chakra. Always take it in and, and ponder it yourself because you are the only one that's going to figure this out. Okay? It's not going to be somebody that's going to come to you and give you all the magic pills or magic this. I mean, I am totally dead set against drugs mm -hmm. for this stuff. But I do believe that some people need them. So never, ever go off your medicine unless, of course, you have discussed anything with your doctor. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but, but I was the type of person that um, I've always been into holistic medicine and studied that for quite some time. Uh, and I, don't, and I, I do believe that some of these, um, and I'll go, just go back to the very first one, which was Prozac a long, long time ago. And now we have a plethora of drugs, you know, that are, that are there to help anxiety. Um, you eventually have to find that that place in you. It's not going to be the drugs. Drugs can help you through hard times, you know what I mean, where you literally can't function properly. Yep. But, um, no, it's that, that's not where it comes from. It comes from the realization that you you have control. We have two types of – we have two sides – well, you know this. We have two different parts of our brain. We have our conscious brain and our subconscious brain. And our subconscious brain does not care what, whether it's good for you or bad for you. It's going to do, it's going, if you, if you have um, a dream or you have um, something that you want to do with your life, um, that is the part that has to be reprogrammed because, um, again, you have programmed it to think a certain way. It's going to produce those results. If you think if you you can change that kind of what I just call it, it was like a computer program. We go in and we change our we change our software. We have to change our software in our brain, okay? Because that's where it's coming from. And once you get that software changed and that thinking mechanism, I call it the tape recorder in your head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. plays over and over and over. You have to become and one big thing is conscious of what you're thinking. What are you thinking moment by moment? Because you can go into a down spiral and not even realize, wow, I'm thinking this again. I'm back on that. I'm back on that, that same path that's taking me to an anxious situation. And you can feel it in your body symptoms. And you need to stop and say, what, are you, what am I thinking? What am I thinking right now? What am I scared of? What am I fearful of? Yeah. And that is what cognitive change is. You're changing those synapses. You're changing those those thought patterns to a different thought pattern. Okay, so so once a person um, 
well, once you did that, once you, I mean, you did that and you're still on that journey. I, I know what you're saying about that. That's for sure. But what about, just tell me how that helped you. I, I know this isn't about losing weight. This isn't about losing weight, but I, I'm curious. I want to know how, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have been working on, you know, mindset and are positive, but they still can't shed those 100 pounds. What, why, why was that different for you? Oh boy. Um, well, when you have your 10 year old look at you and say, mommy, I want you to be around for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? I don't want you to die. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty scary thought. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that pushed me, but that was, that was there, you know, always in the back of my mind. Um, the, the reason I decided that this was going to be um, a thing I wanted to do was that literally every day was a struggle for me. And for people who are extremely overweight, it is a struggle. Their, their joints hurt, their body hurts, their, and they're definitely, you know, in, in, a, in a, a sore situation health-wise. Um, I just guess I woke up one day and just said, enough is enough. And for people, you have to find, you have to get to that place in your journey where you decide. It is not going to be that person that, I mean, I can use an example. I mean, this lady I know, she, as she goes to my gym. I see her, I've seen her for the last year. And I know her, her, her intention was to lose weight and become something um, that she probably dreams of. And yet, I still, she's still the same as she was a year ago. I don't know what's going. I have not um, got into a, long, a lengthy enough conversation to understand what her, what her situation is. Mm -hmm. um, it is different for everybody, but there is a. It, but you've got to get to the root of the emotional problem. It's not about eating. It's not about eating the wrong things because I eat wrong things. You know, I'm not a perfect person, and if you can't enjoy life and learn. Um, how to enjoy life as well as maintain your health, um, it's, it's going to be a struggle for you. And if for everybody, it is, it is a time and a space that they have to come upon. Um, they can, they can uh, sought out help and, and find people to help them, but it's an internal situation. It's, right. an, it's an emotional so, thing. So let me see Eating if, it is an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I get this right. What happened to you was you went on this journey of um, changing your thoughts. And mm -hmm. uh, in, in that journey, you were able to accomplish, you know, some of that and take responsibility for your life and, and improve your life, it sounds like, from, you know, get rid of the anxiety and be able to have friends and people in your life. But the weight mm -hmm. hadn't come off yet. And then one yeah. day, uh, the, the aha moment for you was when your child says, you know, look, mom, you, I, I don't want you to die from this. Now, I know a lot of children do ask their parents, Mom, quit smoking. I don't want you to die from this. And the mother doesn't hear it. But you were on a journey already. So having that information put in probably went into a really good good soil, if, if you want to put it that way. It went into good soil. And then mm -hmm. you did what you did with the anxiety. You mm -hmm. kind of said, you know what? You're not going to whip me around you and tell me what to do. I'm now going to take charge again. And I'm going to be telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm Basically. choosing, I'm choosing how I want to do this. So how did you decide, what kind of a, a, a regimen did you go on for you that worked better than doing nothing? Well, I can tell you one thing I do know. When you are in, a, in, in a mode, you need to heal yourself emotionally first. Mm-hmm. Because it, I, I truly believe this, and I've seen it in many, many people that I've counseled and and worked with, that <clears throat> until you find an emotional stability in your life, that that weight is not going to come off. Because so, okay. literally, if, I if somebody doesn't believe, know what an emotional stability is, give us a couple examples of what that was well, for you. Um, where you love yourself, okay? Where you come to a point of loving what you are, not what people expect you to be, 
where you literally, and, and again, I'm still on that journey. I'm not going to tell you I'm there, okay? Mm-hmm. But, but when you literally come to stop having to have validation from other people that you're okay. Wow. Okay? Mm-hmm. When, when you have to have validation from your best friend or your, even your husband, your partner, whoever, mm-hmm. when you have to have that validation from somebody, you're, you're not at a point where you, I think you can do anything with your life. Wow. That's a strong that's, statement. I hope people hear yeah, that. I hope they hear that because you're right. That's the number one thing. Until you do not need to be validated by anybody else. You are validated by yourself, your thoughts. You've taken responsibility about who you are and where you want to be. Then you can start that journey of a physical transformation. I really, truly believe, or you, or you may be in a bad situation. You may be in an abusive situation or a situation that you're not feeling good about on a daily basis. And until you heal that situation... I don't think you're going to go forward. This is just my personal opinion, Mm -hmm. but forward in, um, you know, uh, any physical changes in your body, because I really think your body, um, this is just my opinion. I don't know if there's any, I'm not going to say (laughs) there is, but I've, (laughs) but, but but, but your body actually holds on to that Mm -hmm. weight. Mm -hmm. It holds on to it. And I don't care what you do. You can, you can eat 300 calories a day and exercise your butt off because I did. Mm-hmm. Okay? Did. Literally starve yourself. And nothing happened. Wow. Nothing happened for years and years and years until I came to the point of really realizing I don't need to be validated by anybody. I love myself. Now it's time to work on myself. Yeah. Okay. So okay. that's... That is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm glad we came. I'm glad we're going to stop here because this is so such an amazing information. I think, you know, if anybody who listens to this and just gets this far in it will definitely have so much value from your story and your experience. And I really want to thank you for this. Now, I, I do want to um, tell people that if they want more information, you are writing a book and you do have a blog. And I will post it under this blog so they can go there. Uh, you are writing a book, right? Or you're doing something amazing. I forgot what it was, but was that what it was? I'm, I'm actually, I've got several books written at oh, this wow. point, but okay. um, I'm not doing anything with them right now. So. Okay. Well, well, okay. Well, if they want to check out your book or check more out about you, I'll have your information in this blog. I'll have your Facebook page and your um, blog. And you can lo- learn more about Deanne Hall and her journey and hopefully I'll get to do another interview with you and um, we can you can share some more of these um, great, mm-hmm. uh, moments well, I have, that I have so on. much to share because I you know I have been in abusive situations I have been um, you know I'd love to share about uh, women being abused okay because mm-hmm. I was in a very abusive situation for many years or well it, it was over a year um, many many women are in that situation. That is uh, that is prime to my heart right now. Well, then let's do that um, for our next interview then about being in abusive situations and how we're able to um, pull out of them and um, grow and become a fuller person and a, a bigger contributor. I think you know once you get out of an abusive relationship, you have a lot so much more to contribute as you have learned. Um, and we'll do that next, okay? That would be a great one, Nina. Um, one last thing I, I want to say to everybody. Oh, sure. um, if I could give you one piece of advice, and always remember this, is live from your heart and live in love, okay? And um, the judgmentalism in this world has got to go. Oh, no kidding. Okay? Oh, it's yeah. got to go, okay? You, um, you only, you are going to bring to you what you give. You know, if you, whatever, whatever you reap, you sow. We all know that. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you want, if you want, whatever you want, put out there, okay? If you want to smile, smile. If you want love, put love out there. I you know what it. I mean? Yep. And it will come back to you. That's a beautiful way to end this call. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome, Anita.